Good evening, everybody, uh, friends, colleagues, uh, members of which I think are union, the union movement, civil society, the private sector, judging by the, uh, by the respondents to this, uh, to this launch. Um, and as you know, this is the, the, what we would call the UCT or the Cape Town launch, as it were, of what was, I think, a groundbreaking study for us, at least as academics, because it was multidisciplinary and multi-university uh, based. Um, for our report, the formal uh, title of the report, which was Betrayal of the Promise, How South Africa is Being Stolen. Um, and in many senses uh, uh, reflects a combination of skills, which I'll get to in, in producing the report. Uh, this particular launch is being undertaken in collaboration with the Development Policy Research Unit, uh, the institute I uh, manage, the University of Cape Town's Faculty of Commerce, uh, and UCT's Faculty of Law, as well as the Center for Complex Systems in Transition at the Stellenbosch University. And I'm happy to report that both the deans of the Commerce Faculty and the Faculty of Law are here as well. Um, so this report really uh, arose out of the State Capacity Research Project uh, under the convenership of Professor Mark Swilling, who I'll introduce in a minute. Um, and as I indicated, is a combination of the skill set of academics from UCT, from WITS, from UJ, from Stellenbosch University, and as you may have noted, an unnamed uh, journalist. Um, uh, b before, I, before I go on, there are just two important announcements from the Faculty of Law. The first is you'll notice a whole bunch of stickers at your table or where you're sitting. Please, these are not, most of you are not students, so I don't need to tell you this, but don't remove the stickers. <laughs> uh, I know most of you won't. And uh, if you are eating anything, take, the, uh, take your stuff with you because there's an exam happening in this venue tomorrow. Um, the second is probably more important is that the, this, the proceedings and the event will be recorded and the recording will be made publicly available. So uh, as long as you're all aware of that, uh, if you are worried about saying anything, then r rather not, because it will be publicly, uh, made publicly available. Um, so I was looking back at this report, and, uh, and uh, Mark may reflect on it, but for me it was a, it was a whirlwind of meetings in Stellenbosch and uh, uh, collaborative engagements at his, at his little house in uh, Stellenbosch, uh, usually on weekends, in trying to craft this report. Um, but it was formally re released on May 25th, uh, 2017, uh, which seems... An, age ago, really, but it was only a month ago. Um, and I was trying to find a way to think about or, or positioning or explain to you what we try to do in this report. And, and in many senses, two bookends in South Africa at this time may explain what we try to do. The first, the first event was the one prior to the release of the report, which was the um, unburdening panel, if you recall, of the South African Council of Churches. And the unburdening panel was really about individuals, officials, uh, government officials, uh, political officials coming to the South African Council of Churches and providing evidence of corruption and corrupt activities. The second, which happened after the report, was of course the release of 200,000 odd emails emanating from the desk of a senior manager at Sahara, now referred to as hashtag Gupta Leaks, right? And in many senses, this report is a bridge. It's a bridge between those two types of information, if you like. The first is really um, reporting from civil society, from individuals about frustrations with a corrupt state, frustrations with a corrupt government uh, or government officials. Um, but no real order, if you like, just a set of pieces of information. The second um, was really, uh, uh, I'll come to an example of it, but it was really sort of really incisive but important um, journalistic uh, inputs from the Daily Maverick, from Ama Bungani, and so on. But what was missing, and I think this is what, what led to Mark's uh, convenership of the group, was, was more structure, was more analytical rigor was more empirical veracity around how you think about corruption. It's not just a series of events. It's not just 
uh, crime style novels, right, of what people are doing. It really is a structure. There really is a, uh, if you like, a very formal way in which uh, individuals and institutions can become corruptible. Um, and, and I think partly in trying to provide that rigor and structure is what drove this, this project. So let me give an example. There's an excellent article in Daily Maverick, amongst many, about Transnet, right? Um, and it involves a locomotive tender, the kickback to Gupta Enterprises, and it reads really, and I read through it just before this event, it reads like a, I actually wrote this down, this is what I thought of it, right? It reads like a crime novel of email exchanges, shady dealings with Chinese firms and offshore companies and free holidays in Dubai. Now what that elicits though is derision, it's shock, but what is the structure? What is it that drives uh, a particular set of institutions and individuals to engage in, in, in criminal activity? Now, the economist in me would suggest, and this didn't get into the report, so one of the, one of the jokes we have between us is I made sure that the term neoliberal disappeared in the report. Some of you may be very happy, but others may not be so happy. But it was this multidisciplinary approach. But the way I thought of what was going on, which didn't appear in the report, is that it's almost like a market for corruption, right? And in a perfectly competitive market for corruption, everybody in this room gets a little bit and the equilibrium is stable. And is it possible that what has happened is that the market for equilibrium, uh, the market for corruption has now an unstable in the equilibrium because there's a monopolist in the game. And the monopolists, as we know, are the very few players that control this market for corruption. And in many ways, that was the beginning, at least for me, of thinking about a more structured way of thinking about corruption. Um, what this suggests, is that we will, the project will continue, and Mark may talk about this as well. This isn't the end, this is the first, I think by academic standards, fairly rushed job, but we think we did a good job um, uh, in trying to understand state capture in a more, in a more um, uh, formal way. But, but the work will continue, and we're happy to talk about this uh, afterwards as well. So that's it for me. Let me just give you a lineup of where we're going. We, we will proceed uh, with, with Mark providing an intervention, and then we have three, I think, excellent discussants. What I'm going to do is introduce everybody at once and then go and sit uh, instead of having a, a, a sort of broken uh, discussion. And, and we'll run through them, but I'll be over here keeping time, just making sure that uh, uh, our, our panelists don't talk for too long. So. As I said, we'll, we'll kick off with Mark. Mark is um, convener in this, in this particular instance, convener of the State Capacity Research Group. Um, he is personally a distinguished professor of sustainable development in the School of Public Leadership at Stellenbosch University, and he's also co-director of the Center for Complex Systems in Transition, and he's academic director of the Sustainability Institute. So maybe if we could just welcome Mark. Um, we'll... We'll then kick off, um, if I just run through the others, we'll kick off with Tabi Leoka, who's our first discussant, um, and she's an economist in financial services and has worked in London and in South Africa. Um, and the specific question I've asked her, right, that she will address is what are the economic implications of institutionalized corruption within the South African context? Our next discussant will be Kule Duma, who is, um, as you can see, he's, he's the youngest person on the panel and is deliberately chosen. So we want the voice of the youth as well. Um, but his specific question will be focusing on the political environment and the political, political consequences of state capture. Um, he's a researcher with Mark at the Center for Complex Systems and is currently doing his postgraduate diploma in sustainable development. Um, his back, academic background is in the social sciences and he's also a former student activist. Um, we'll then uh, round off with Professor Pierre de Foss. If you follow uh, Twitter, you'll, you'll know Professor Pierre de Foss. He's a keen tweeter. Um, but he's also um, the Claude Leon Foundation Chair in Constitutional Governance in the Department of Public Law at, here at UCT. And he writes a blog, Constitutionally Speaking, which is syndicated to the Daily Maverick. And his specific question will be the legal implications of and the possible remedies for institutionalized corruption. So if you can give a round of applause to all the panelists. And um, 
We'll kick off with Mark. Okay, thanks very much, uh, Karun. And uh, it's 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 a great it's it's a great pleasure to be here at UCT uh, to to kind of uh, share this uh, this work that, as you said, a lot of it took place in discussions in Stellenbosch. Uh, I mean, you, you're right. I mean, neoliberalism did uh, get axed <laughs> from the thinking, but rent seeking survived. So we did a trade there. You know, so, yeah. um, Okay, so there, there were, there were, I think there, four moments that bookend this story for me. There are well-known moments. The one, the, uh, the, the one is the Marikana massacre, and the other is Jonas's decision not to sell the national treasury for 600 million rand. One is a form of mass resistance, and the other is resistance from of an individual from the point of view of their conscience. The other two moments were the uh, Weiterkloof incident, the landing of the Gupta planes at Weiterkloof, and the cabinet reshuffle. One, the abuse of state resources, and the other, the abuse of power. So the question that we need to ask is, how did this happen, and how can we understand what happened? And our core argument, which is what uh, it kind of crept up on us rather than being present at the beginning of, of, of our work, is that what we are talking about is a silent coup. It's, and that's represented most graphically and clearly in the fact that the top six of the ANC did not approve of the cabinet reshuffle. That marked a, a new phase, which some are arguing, like Steve Friedman, is triggering a pushback by the, by the ANC. So after the, the vote of no confidence did not succeed, uh, Steve Friedman has argued, there's a whole bunch of stuff that didn't go uh, uh, the, the, the way it should have gone from the point of view of, of the president. Malefe didn't got, get reappointed, Ngubani has resigned, um, uh, the, the ESCOM board is being reshuffled, etc., etc. So we're in, this, we're in a kind of interregnum moment where we're not quite sure how this is really going to pan itself out. But, at the, but what, you, what we can say is that the essence of South African politics now is about capture and resistance, of, and resistance in different forms. To make sense of uh, a, a huge piles of information uh, we, 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 we established a set of concepts. But maybe just before I, I, I get into that uh, and, and make a comment that, I suppose, puts this in, in, in a political context. Just before the cabinet reshuffle, I was contacted by Mkhlebisi Jonas. And Mkhlebisi Jonas said, you know, what are the academics doing about what is going on here? We need a coherent analysis to make sense of the story because... The story that is being told, the narrative which is dominant, is that this is just about corruption. And that narrative needs to change. People need to understand that this is a political project. And I thought that made a lot of sense. And I looked around the academy and I was, to be honest, disappointed by what I realized uh, was not going on, which was uh, an inadequate response to this betrayal of the promise. So the core concepts that we put, into, that we put together to, to build the, the, the conceptual framework is rents and rent seeking. And this really boils down to a very simple proposition, which is you cannot have development without the allocation of rents. Rents as gains made that are beyond what is possible under ordinary conditions of risk is what happens when you allocate resources to address historical disadvantages. But once you, once you set up a, a development program as a rent management system, you, as exactly what Kroon has already referred to, you set up a marketplace. 
There's competition for access to those rents. There's legal ways of getting access through lobbying or legislation. And there are illegal ways of getting access through basically paying uh, for privileged access to, the, to those, those flows of rents. But this idea of rents really sits in, inside of a, of, a, of, of, a, of, a, of, a, of a political economy, the South African political economy, which is really built on rents. So the debate triggered by the Public Protector's report on the Reserve Bank uh, highly restrictive mandate really is about a mandate that uh, uh, some have referred to recently in, in the popular press as a rent-seeking banking sector uh, that is able to extract uh, far more than it, than it should, should be able to if there was a more competitive environment. So we're talking about rents in quite specific ways in order to make sense of what unfolded. We talk about a distinction between corruption and state capture. You can have corruption without state capture, but you can't have state capture without corruption. In the political science literature, we talk about developmental corruption. There is such a thing as developmental neopatrimonialism, case study being Rwanda, uh, where you centralize rents, you have a long-term vision, and you uh, limit, try and limit as far as possible corruption at lower levels. Uh, we talk about repurposing of state institutions because capture in and of itself is insufficient. Uh, it's, it implies it's an, almost an end in itself. It's a bit like a, a, a kind of power theory uh, that seeking power for its own sake is, 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 is a sufficient explanation. Repurposing suggests repurposing for, a, for something and to achieve a particular end. We talk about the symbiotic relationship between the constitutional and the shadow state. This really is an idea that comes out of the literature on neopatrimonialism. A lot of that literature is addressing the African context, but we're different in, in many ways. We're not talking here about the, the formal and the informal. We're talking about the, 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 the constitutional state, the bureaucratic, law-based uh, system interacting with what we call a shadow state, which is where a whole bunch of networks are constituted, and one in particular is, is, is hegemonic, which we call the Gupta-Zuma uh, uh, network, sometimes referred to as the Zupta ne network. And then we talk about a political project uh, in order to say that this is more than just a criminal takeover. We, we, we locate the explanation for what has happened during the Zuma years with reference to an analysis of what happened during the Mbeki era. During the Mbeki era, the constitutional transformers were dominant. This was a set of people within the, the state who believed that it was possible to use state instruments within the framework of the constitutional order to achieve uh, the developmental and transformation objectives. However, we argued that there's a kind of mismatch between what was happening within the economy and what was happening in economic policy. Within the econ economy, there was a process of corporate restructuring taking place. In 1994, when the deal was, or during the early 90s when the deal was done, the corporate sector could be represented by a couple of people, uh, maybe up to 10 people sitting around the table. The corporate sector has been fundamentally restructured, and the drivers are uh, three basic things. Firstly, the shareholder value movement, which said focus on your knitting and increase returns to shareholders. The, so that led, led to unbundling and the repurposing of, 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 of many large con conglomerates into a multiplicity of uh, very strategically focused uh, units, with some exceptions, like the Vest. Secondly, black economic empowerment, uh, which is really the transfer to, of, of, of assets and wealth to black individuals. The shareholder value movement and the, the transfers as a result of these two, shareholder value movement and DEE, have, been, have now been quantified by Nimrod, Nimrod Zalk's work and shows over specific periods of time that this is enormous, massive transfers of wealth with, which have detracted from investment in productive capacity of the economy. And then the third powerful force that has transformed our economy is financialization. Growth by growing the financial sector rather than the secondary and primary sectors. These three together uh, have resulted in a fundamental challenge that we currently face still, 
and we faced then, which is how do we find the kind of investment that is needed uh, that is able to substantially expand our productive capacity. That kind of investment needs to be long-termist and dividend-oriented, rather than short-termist and capital gains-oriented. Our economy was driven by the wrong kinds of dynamics. Did state policy deal with that or try and direct it? Overall, no. State policy was focused on macroeconomic stabilization, deregulation, black economic empowerment in order to transform uh, the commanding heights of the economy so that more was transferred into black ownership. And the mineral energy complex was left largely intact, and some would argue even reinforced. So that's really the core challenge um, that we faced. And the result is that we did not have the substantial increases in investment and a commitment to long-termism and dividend-oriented investment. Uh, that we would have liked. Instead, as Harun's work uh, shows, we, had, we became dependent on short-term capital flows, capital-intensive and concentrated sectors, low savings, high internal rates of return, and a job-starved growth path. That's not what we need. And the end result was an increase in poverty levels. By the way, Harun, when I presented this yesterday at Stellenbosch University's economics department, Savas says your numbers are wrong. <laughs> Poverty. Um, so we, South Africa is an interesting um, uh, outlier. Harun's work shows that we normally when you have high rates of return on investment, you have high levels of investment. We have high rates of return on investment with low levels uh, uh, of, of, of investment. And that's a big part of the... Um, the political crisis that built up as a result of the consequences of that, persistent unemployment, growing poverty, etc., etc. So the critique of the constitutional transformers that began to emerge initially in uh, the ANC Youth League uh, and then spread and now has become pretty strong within, uh, uh, within the ANC itself is that the constitutional order itself is a problem is a constraint. And so we, talk, we refer to the radical reformers that start to emerge during the Mbeki era who now express themselves most strongly in the idea of radical economic transformation. But before we get there, Paul was in 2007 when Zuma is elected president of the ANC. 2008, Mbeki is recalled. Our report shows in Chapter 2 that by the time uh, Zuma is elected president, he, is, he and his family are, are very solidly embedded in the Gupta networks. However, you will find in our report that we argue that the Gupta networks should be conceptualized as brokers rather than as pu puppeteers. So Max de Pere, for example, has depicted the Gupta networks as puppeteers. We rather depict them as brokers, and we're influenced by the work of a researcher called Liebenberg, who has studied the role of brokers in war economies in African countries, like, like Sierra Leone, where you have patrons or warlords who bring in brokers to manage um, the, 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 the transfers or the, the, the transactions, the shadow state transactions on a national and a global scale. And these are often uh, people from outside of the country. Lebanese, Greeks, Israelis, uh, who uh, start, who don't have very much in their home countries, they accumulate uh, substantial resources, being brokers in their, in their adopted countries, and some of them then get even too powerful for the patrons, like in Sierra Leone, they had to, the, 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 the president had to call in executive outcomes to take out the brokers who had now formed their own army and, were, and, and their own political agenda. So we use this idea of the brokers uh, to basically depict the role of the Gupta networks as a useful one-stop shop for the patron to manage transactions on a need-to-know basis where the patron can say, listen, if you want to do this deal, you need to go through that clearinghouse. It saves the patron from a multiplicity of transactions and reduces risk. And, it has, and, and, the, and the Guptas were able to present themselves as the can-do guys who will just make stuff happen, don't ask too many questions. And that became quite useful uh, in the 
political project that was assembled uh, in particular after the second election, 2014. But the preparations for uh, all of that really, or that the foundations for all of that get put in place after uh, Zuma becomes president in 2008. So there are two, uh, as I've already indicated, these two, these two periods. Um, during the 2008-2014 period, you basically see the right people being put in place into key positions, and the appointment of Malusi uh, Gigaba as the Minister of Public Enterprises in 2010 is a key, is a key moment, who then, then puts in place, a, uh, reshuffles the boards of a whole bunch of state-owned enterprises, preparing them for really the uh, major move after 2014, which is to use the state-owned enterprises as the driver of radical economic transformation. There's a, clear, uh, there's a clear attempt, a clear focus during this, uh, from about 2010 onwards, on centralizing rent management. And we spent quite a lot of time trying to figure this out. And it became clear that something really interesting happened in 2000. During the 1990s, we saw, uh, actually originating in the 1980s, but really becoming very strong during the 1990s, we saw a global movement taking place in the governance field called the New Public Management Movement. The New Public Management, and I was, I was running a public management school uh, during, during the 1990s and, and took, this, took this on unsuccessfully. Um, uh, in, 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 in my view, but the new public management really wanted to reconstitute the state as a contract state, to uh, contract out to the private sector everything that needed to be done, to decentralize to departments uh, a maximum amount of decision making, have um, accounting officers uh, report, for, report for budgets, uh, and the result was what uh, the Public Affairs Re uh, Research Institute in Johannesburg calls the contract state. And they've calculated that this resulted in the contracting out of 500 billion rands worth of services and goods for the state. But what happened in the year 2000, in line with new public management theory, the state tender board was abolished and decision making transferred to departments. Now that is risky enough, but if you do that at the same time as you balloon the size of the public service, in particular the senior management service, you are, you are taking a huge risk. Internationally the lessons are if you're going to balloon, keep control of the money. Or if you're going to decentralize, keep control of the size of the, of the public service. If you do both, if you decentralize and balloon, you're constructing the perfect storm. And that results in a very competitive, corrupt market. A market for corruption, exactly uh, the term, term, term we used. And there's a lot of evidence that in the build-up to the 2014 election, Zuma in particular was very, very worried about this. I mean, after all, it was Zuma who sent Pravim Gordon in 2012 to Limpopo to shut down the, the, the Malema uh, rent-seeking network. It was Zuma who told Pravim to go and do that. And that's what it, that's 2012. Uh, it was part of basically Malema's exit uh, from, 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 from the ANC as well. The ANC election manifesto in 2014 had the re-establishment of the state tender board as part of the manifesto. I mean, why, why would you do that? Uh, and basically what you, what you, basically our argument is that part of what the Zuma project is really about is the centralization, the construction of a, of, of a monopoly in the, in the corruption market uh, in order to limit the, uh, the corruption taking place at lower levels. So for example, Chippy Olver did this extraordinary expose um, of unbelievable, absolutely blatant, uh, corruption in the Nelson Mandela, Nelson Mandela main municipality. Nothing was done from higher levels to stop that. So basically what we, what we argue is in many ways state capture can be interpreted as a strategy to limit corruption but at lower levels. 
in order to centralize control of the allocation of looting. So from 2014 onwards, we argue there are six significant trends once the foundations have been put in place between 2008 and 2014 put in place by, by a, a group that we call the radical reformers, who then take over from the constitutional transformers and have much less respect for the constitutional and legal uh, constraints to governance. I mean, Ntabisi Jonas tells a really interesting story going to visit, um, um, uh, I'll have to mention the name of the, of the provincial government, a uh, particularly well-known provincial government, and he sits there and he gets a briefing from the provincial government uh, about their program, and he listens to it, and as the meeting is breaking up and people are getting up, the Premier of the province now shouts across the table to, um, to um, BC Jonas as Deputy Minister of Finance and says, and Deputy Minister, I just want you to know, we are going to break the law because we can't do what we want within the law. Half joke, you know, that's how, how it is in that, in, in that political context. So, Six key trends. Firstly, the focus on state-owned enterprises. So in, in 2014, the DTI publishes a critically important document, which is the first time in government policy the phrase radical economic transformation is referred to. And the document specifies the need to construct 100 black industrialists, and it quantifies the total spend of the state-owned enterprises as roughly 200 billion. It says, this is an opportunity for transformation of the economy. So the, the focus has shifted away from what some people refer to uh, as Mbeki era B, as hanging onto the coattails of white monopoly capital, uh, to using state in enterprises and state institutions and their procurement spend to build a new black industrial class. So that's the, that's the, that's the first key strategy. The second is uh, routing out, getting rid of the good cops in the security, intelligence, and prosecutorial um, prosecuting environment. Thirdly, is control of the of the uh, of the of the public service through NEMOS, the national. Uh, it's, a, it's a national strategy after 2014 to to expand and restructure the public service, reporting directly to the president. Um, basically building and consolidating a loyal political bureaucratic class. Fourthly, strengthening of the Premier League under the leadership of Ace Magushule, with all accounts suggesting that Ace Magushule is really the most significant confidant in the political elite, uh, um, in the power elite uh, of the president. Fifthly, the hollowing out of executive authority by all accounts Cabinet governance has virtually disintegrated. Cabinet meetings are kind of somewhat of a joke. And uh, the, re the replacement with a whole bunch of kitchen cabinets. So Zuma's favorite method for dealing with the problem is to set up an interministerial committee. The interministerial committee are kind of ad hoc structures, normally uh, uh, comprising a fairly predictable group of uh, people, loyalists, including state security. Uh, the, the, sometimes they meet very, very briefly because the decision has basically been made and goes through the IMC, and that's a cabinet decision. Um, uh, within the public service, quite often, if you say this, uh, and in, during the Mbeki era, if you said this is a cabinet decision, you knew that it's gone through Joel Nechetenzi's uh, po policy unit. It's been processed, the consequences assessed, goes to cabinet. Cabinet decision carried weight. Cabinet decisions now don't carry weight. What matters in the public service now is which network has sponsored this decision. Uh, and if it's, if, it's, if it's the right network, it carries weight. If it's the wrong network, it doesn't. And then sixthly, obviously, the capture of the national treasury. And the capture of the national treasury basically pr uh, provides access to four key institutions, or, or key, um, three institutions and one mechanism. The Financial Intelligence Center, which before the cabinet reshuffle was the last source of intelligence within the state that was not captured, and that's really the, the unit that tracks illicit financial flows, and provided the large bulk of the information that you get in the, in the uh, state of capture report by the public protector. Secondly, the, the uh, Chief Procurement Officer, the Office of the Chief Procurement Officer, uh, which was set up, so the State Tender Board wasn't re-established, but 
the Chief Procurement Officer was. Uh, and that is a very particularly important individual who has the power to, to really monitor and intervene in the procurement process if, if he suspects there are particular problems. So it's a really key office to, to get hold of. Thirdly, the Public Investment Corporation, which is the second largest investor on the JSE, and the power to issue guarantees. The Minister of Finance can write a letter, write a letter to issue a guarantee. And that's particularly important if you want to do the nuclear deal. So that's really the framework. Uh, that's really the, the core argument. And our suggestion that uh, this amounts to a silent coup by a power elite that manages a symbiotic relationship between the constitutional and shadow state in order to manage a, rent, a centralized man rent management system that has basically put in place uh, a, a powerful kind of monopoly force reinforced with coercion and, and other uh, mechanisms. So just to give you one example of the many, many, many examples that we referred to in the case, the Tegeta, which is the Tegeta case. Uh, April 2015, Mulefe is appointed CEO of ESCOM. In May, Mulefe meets uh, Gencor and says, I'm not going to increase the price of coal that we pay you beyond 150 rand per ton, which was set in 1993. In August, Glencore puts Optimum Mine into business rescue. In September, Zwane travels to Switzerland with the Guptas to meet De Glencore. They come back, Glencore agrees to sell for 2.1 billion to the Guptas. ESCOM then gives Optimum a, a 700 billion rand contract, paying together 470 rand per ton not the 150 that was rejected just a few months earlier. In April 2016, Malefe, Malefe takes responsibility for awarding Tegeta a 586 million prepayment for coal for Arnott, Arnott Power Station, which is actually a part of the payment required to buy the Optimum Mine. And now there's a conflict over uh, converting it into a loan. The nuclear story, similarly, uh, the Guptas buy a uranium mine on the assumption that a deal is going to be made with the Russians to build a nuclear power fleet that doesn't really pan out. Uh, we suggest in the report that the Russians have paid for the local government election and they want payback. The Russians, whoever they talk to, are, are, are very, very frustrated. Why don't these South Africans actually get on and make a proper decision like we do in Russia and just get this thing done? And why are we constantly told to diminish the size of the, of, of the, of, of the contract? Um, but this nuclear deal is just ripping its way through the constitutional, institutional, social and moral fabric of, the, of South Africa's democracy. It's at the very heart of our conflict. And it's an energy choice about an energy future that is in, aligned with Putin's image of how he's going to uh, maintain control of the global economy through building nuclear power plants, which one commentator described as a combination of a, an embassy and a military base. So in conclusion, there are three things that have not happened yet. The, in, the, the independent electoral commission has not quite yet been captured. There are suggestions that if the Guptas manage to get control of the IT system of the IEC, the election in December and in 2019 can be rigged. So we've got the list of companies in the bid uh, that closed re re recently, and we're doing an investigation into them. Four of them are clearly okay. Three are suspect. Transnet, uh, there's, there's talk of Transnet uh, trying to solve its capital depletion problems by selling off Transnet properties. Uh, and the tender is supposed to have closed a week ago. And inside of Transnet, there's a general view that this is going to go to the Guptas. Uh, if that happens, this could be one of the biggest land transfers since 94, but to the wrong people. And, th and thirdly, the nuclear deal hasn't happened yet. So these three, the IC, the Transnet properties, nuclear, really is what we should be focusing on and should be the focus of the emerging popular front, uh, which is being assembled 
uh, uh, through lots of discussions with the churches playing a key role. And finally, let me make one final comment. We conclude in, uh, in, the, in, the, in the last chapter, uh, in, in, the, yeah, in the concluding chapter, um, that uh, South Africa has never had an economic policy, a consensus policy. And we took a speech that D.C. Jonas made in Newton Hague uh, uh, one or two weeks after he lost his job, where he talked about a new economic consensus. And that is really uh, the challenge we face. If under the Mbeki era we didn't get uh, the proper match between economic policy and what was going, in, 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 in corp going on in corporate South Africa, uh, which created a set of contradictions that uh, set up the political conditions for the, the, the recall of Mbeki and the rise of, of the Zuma power elite. And if radical economic transformation is about the abuse of state-owned enterprises and procure, uh, procurement to, to ostensibly create the, the 100 black industrialists, if that is uh, problematic because it's focused on heavy industrial infrastructures, uh, capital-intensive infrastructures, rather than the multiplicity of smalls that Harun talks about in his work, then what kind of economic policy are, should, should we be talking about? We had, we had uh, the RDP, then GIA, the social plan from the Department of Labor, uh, then we had the ASGISA, then the developmental state, then the new growth path, now we've got radical economic transformation. Are we actually going to now, once and for all, maybe the good thing that comes out of this crisis is that we face the challenge of building a new economic consensus that is about job creating, livelihood creating, investment by a new breed of investor that is long-termist and dividend seeking rather than short-termist and capital gain seeking. Because if we don't achieve that shift in economic power to underpin, hopefully, a shift in political power, we're going to be back to square one pretty quickly. Thank you. So I'll be talking about the, the cost implications of corruption and state capture on the South African economy. Um, so I'll start with a bit about myself. So I was an economic advisor um, to the Fees Commission. My role included interrogating and analyzing information that was submitted by various people and institutions. Um, I also looked at alternative ways of funding education. I got to understand how difficult it is for the National Treasury to allocate funds with limited resources. Public health, education, social security, housing, all require resources which we currently don't have. South Africa is in a recession and our credit rating is now junk according to Standard & Poor's and also Fitch rating agencies making it even more difficult to fund something like free education in the future. However, the Gupta leaks and everyday revelations on state capture have left me sick to my stomach because resources intended to fund our public health facilities or support the purchase of um, equipment for public schools or even fund free education is being diverted into the pockets of corrupt officials and citizens, naturalized or not. We don't know. Um, I mean, this, I mention this fully aware that we, are, we, that, that we cannot factor in money from corruption into the national budget. But can you imagine how much can be done if we didn't have the money stolen um, from our economy? So the Auditor General released uh, the 2016-2017 financial audits recently. The audits focused on three types of financial misconduct. The first is fruitless and wasteful expenditure, 
which is about 900 million rand. The second is irregular expenditure, which is about 42 billion rands. The third is unauthorized expenditure, which is about 13 billion rands. It is not possible to isolate the value of corruption activity or, or of corrupt activities from these um, recorded amounts, but it is clear that if wasted expenditure from corruption are even a fraction of these amounts, there are a significant cost to the South African economy. Corruption and inequality are closely interrelated. The two phenomena interact in a vicious cycle. Corruption leads to inequality, so corruption leads to an, an unequal distribution of power in society, which in turn translates into a, an unequal distribution of wealth and opportunity. Extreme economic, um, extreme economic inequality and potential capture are too often interdependent. Left unchecked, political institutions become undermined and governments overwhelmingly serve the interest of economic elites and uh, to the detriment of uh, ordinary South Africans. So the government speaks about radical economic transformation and inclusive growth, yet it has failed to deal with the damaging levels of corruption in our society. Economists are often criticized for having two hands, on the one hand, on the other hand, um, but we all have two hands, right? Well, politicians have a special skill of speaking about terms they cannot define, such as radical economic transformation and white monopoly capital. Politicians passionately use these terms, which are supposed to address the inequalities in our society, whilst doing the exact opposite. They use the terms to drum up support, but have no intention of tackling the problem of corruption seriously. Corruption and social inequality are closely related and provide a source for popular discontent. Take, for instance, the recent mining charter that was released by the minister of um, the minister in the department of the, the minister of the department of mineral resources, Museven Zizwane who passed a charter that many in the mining sector consider to be illegal, unconstitutional, with the potential to destroy the mining industry. The charter is divisive and has so far done the opposite of what it intended to do. The public sector corruption has both direct and indirect consequences on the institutions of a country. The direct costs of corruption include inefficiencies resulting from the deterioration of institutions and criminal activities. The direct costs include bribes and also funds wasted on inflated procurement contract prices. The economic cost of, uh, of corruption includes higher transaction costs, misallocation of resources, and the inefficient utilization of public goods, affecting both private and public investment. The fiscal cost includes lower revenue collection due to tax avoidance, the, ta the state's capacity to impose tax and collect taxes becomes weakened, and genuine taxpayers be become disheartened. Lower tax revenues puts pressure on the fiscus, leaving the national treasury with the difficult choice of either increasing taxes which are personal income tax, and we've had two consecutive increases of personal income tax so far, VAT and corporate income tax at a time when households and businesses are struggling. Alternatively, they can also slow the fiscal consolidation, which will have negative implications when it comes to ratings. A culture of corruption affects the rule of law by weakening the institutions tasked, to enforce, tasked with enforcing a country's laws. Corruption also reduces private investment and has a dampening effect on the competitiveness of firms and innovation. If we look at the expenditure side of GDP, for instance, gross fixed capital formation, which is investment, was negative for five consecutive quarters until last quarter when we saw a slight increase. 
Within that data, if you look at private investment, so that's non-government investment and non-state-owned investment, this remains weak, has been weak for the past two years. Another indicator is business confidence. So the business confidence in index in the second quarter of this year declined by 11 points. The last time we saw this decline was actually during the 2008 financial crisis. This is in reac reaction to heightened uncertainty and political noise. According to the corruption protection, uh, per, uh, corruption perception index compiled by Transparency International, South Africa was amongst the list of countries where, whose ranking continued to deteriorate every year. The country ranked 45 out of 176 countries in 2016. A score of zero means that a, con that, um, that a country is perceived as highly corrupt. Therefore, with a, sc with a score below 50, South Africa is, a is among the countries with the most serious corruption problem. This score was compiled before the release of the public, the former public protector state capture report, and also the, Gupta's leaks, the Gupta leaks. So I shudder to know, to think how much we have deteriorated since then. We have yet to know that the, the cost implications of state capture, but we do know that the cabinet reshuffle the ratings downgrade, the political noise and tension have all been negative for the South African economy. So as an economist looking at, you know, ahead and trying to estimate how we are going to grow or go, going to come out of this recession, it be, it's becoming increasingly difficult, especially when there is very little political will to, to help us come out of the, the recession. And unfortunately, with the high unemployment level of 27%, a country that is in recession, uh, you know, polit politics that is very unhealthy for, for growth, South Africa risks being downgraded further. So I urge you as, as the audience, as ordinary South Africans, that you should participate in discussions around state capture, around corruption, regardless of creed, race, anything. And this is the only way we can get ourselves out of this rut. Thank you. Um. Sorry about that. Um, I think the really nice part about this really nice aspect about this uh, group that has come together in this report is that we really come with an array of ideas and ways of looking at the world. Um, and so we interpret things differently as well. Um, but we can all agree that what is happening is really against our collective future. Now, I'm speaking on the political implications of state capture. And honestly, this is a very broad topic um, because it already has impacts and it's going to have impacts as we go into the future. Now, I'm not going to just focus on the politics of the African National Congress and the opposition parties and politics of parliament, um, but I'm also going to talk about a rising politic which is, which is currently in the country. And I think that's characterized by the student movements and many of the movements that have taken place in the last few years. Um, now, in order for, to us, for us to understand inherently where we are, we need to understand that the whole, the, the Zuma years actually emerge out of Bulukwane, as most people know. But this inherently is a, a, a partnership between the left, who had felt marginalized by the Mbegi era years, um, as well as uh, black businesses that had felt that for too long they had been at the co uh, coattails of white business. Um, and so the, 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 what, was, what they were trying to do is centralize power back in the Tuli House instead of power being in the executive. Um, now, years later, after Manu, Manaung and all of these things, we've seen that one aspect, one, one sect of this group has actually emerged. And these are these, the business interests. And they're using the terms of radical economic transformation and et cetera, et cetera. And these, you know, if we're honest, these are very enticing terms, you know, because South Africa needs transformation. I mean, you, you know, to be fair, if you look at this room, 
you know, you realize that. It, it, it needs, you know. So, so, so it's, 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 an, it's, it's absolute necessity, right? But what we must be careful here is our need for a new economics and a group of people that are going to use our need for it for their own personal interest. And that's inherently what, that, that is my perspective. Now, um, we then see that there's a split within the African National Congress that goes beyond ideologies, that goes beyond uh, partnerships. You know, if we, I mean, you know, I, I'm not a forgetful person. Today we see Blades of Money talking against state capture, but he was there in 2009, right? So we, we see beyond ideology, this thing going beyond ideologies. Be, it, it's going to a point of, it's a politics of patronage has been mentioned, but it's also a politics about where we want to go as a country. Um, is, you know, where we want to go and how we see our, our future shaping. Um, now, South Africa at the moment is in flux, and the politics reflects that. I've always said politics is not so much, you know, ideologies that come from a distant land and et cetera, et cetera. But really, politics are about the history of a country, and it's, in, and it's really shaped by what is happening at the country at the moment. Um, now, there is an argument to say that, um, to say that, the state in South Africa has always been captured. I mean, there is a merit to that argument. We see the alliance between Africana business and the, African, and, 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 and the apartheid government, right? But, and, and that's what a lot of people who want to protect themselves have actually used that argument. But what I'm saying is, as a democratic state, surely the thing that we would wish for ourselves is to make sure that government does not have any kind of undue flu influence, be it, be it business, be it the Guptas, or be whatever it is, right? It must be government by the people and for the people. Because what is the point of our elections? What is the point of going and voting? What is the point of political parties if we're going to be controlled by other people, shadows that we ourselves don't understand? Um, and so, as I've said, young people today really represent the politics of the future in terms of Young people are very worldwide detached from the political space. And this is a, this is a result of the post-2008 era that we find ourselves in. Um, and, and basically, young people have kind of come up with an almost entrepreneurial politics, if you can call it that. So instead of going into the systems, instead of joining the political parties and that and that and that, they have then found themselves you know, uh, um, taking on a politics of disruption that understands that it's the system itself that needs to be fixed because what we have in South Africa is a situation where you don't fix the system. You, 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 you change the faces and you're happy with yourself because the faces are all black, but the mechanisms and the operations of the state still remain the same, right? The apparatus, the security apparatus still remains the same. Look at Marikana, right? That is not something that just came out of nowhere. The way miners were treated there is, is, is how, you can go back to, to killings in the Rand uh, what used to be called the RAND back in the 1920s, right? There's always been an, an element of violence that has been exerted on miners and workers in this country, and it continues, right? And that, I think, is how young people look at transformation, not just about changing faces, but also about the system itself. Um, so, sorry, my phone keeps on, <laughs> keeps on switching. Um, but as I've said, we're used to, as you know, you know people call us born freeze. I, I don't believe in that term. Well, I, I call us guinea pigs of rainbowism, and, um, and, <laughs> and there's been a lot of it that has failed. But if anything that we've been taught in the last 20 years, you know, as a young person, is not to trust the state, right? And I think Marikana makes that clear, how they treated us in Fizma school is clear, but also not to trust business itself, right? And not to, you, so we're very skeptical of anyone that is older than us. <laughs> we're very skeptical, and for good reason. I mean, look at the mess we're in. And we normalize, what, what is very interesting about South Africa, we normalize madness. And I think young people, I think young people you know, every day, if you, if, you, if you travel between Cape Town and Stellenbosch, you post Kai Licha on a daily basis. And you know, you post that. The fact that we think that is normal is crazy. The fact that we've normalized that is it's just, it's, it's crazy for me. You know? so, so it's about really fighting an absurd system. And sometimes you've got to fight it with absurdity in itself. Um, so, and, and there's other things that we've really been, we, we've really been criticized about, our preoccupation with race and et cetera, et cetera. And on that, I'd, I'd really like to say that, you know, um, for us, we, we're refusing to live in non-existent utopias. And instead, we'd want to build real utopias. I mean, we can't not talk about race in this country, especially when it's the experience of people on a daily basis. 
You know, I understand the need for people to want to live in the future. But when you're so caught up in the future that you don't see what's happening in the present, it's problematic. And it's what we find ourselves in today. But as I said, I, I, I can't speak myself, I can't be the voice of all young people. I always say, I always used to say during the movement, that we're heterogeneous people, right? With different ideas, different experiences. But what I definitely can say is that there is a new politics that is forming. And that is a leftist politics in nature that is really preoccupied with social justice. And this is world over. We now see people are, you know, people are amazed in Britain right now how Corbyn became almost the voice of young people. You know, how the socialist who had been forgotten in the 1970s has now come and emerged again. Right? And how, how can you blame young people when young people are so skeptical of, of what um, Thatcherism and, uh, and Reaganism has brought us in the last 20, 30 years? Right? We're the first generation, especially in, 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 in Western countries, that is going to have less, make less, than our parents before us. So, um, so and, 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 and as a result, we're actually extremely entrepreneurial. So you've got this interesting thing where we are very skeptical towards any form of capitalism, but at the same time, we're extremely entrepreneurial. So that is maybe the new can, economics, I, I, I don't know. Um, but I really, I really also want to say that why I'm specifically on why I'm, my input in this report is not so much because the, the, what Ngavis Jonas had, had talked about, corruption, corruption. I mean, you might grow up in South Africa, you have corruption on a daily basis. You, know? you almost become desensitized to it. You know? um, but the issue for me is, if I've been involved, one thing, if I've been involved in the student movement, and we now see that there's a movement against gender-based violence, and there are basis of movements that young people are talking about, you can only transform society into being a better society when the state is capable of doing that job. If I can tell you anything, about, about, uh, about any movement that's happened in this country is that when you've arrived at the state, you yourself have been surprised at how they don't understand the situation that's happening. So the state has to have the capacity, the state has to have the money to make sure that free education is a thing. If the state is being hollowed out and the state is being looted, then how can I, how, how can I ask for those things? How can I envision those things? I mean, we're getting, you know, I, I had mentioned this a couple of weeks ago, but let's think about this, the position that we're in. Right? How do we talk about imagining a future tomorrow? How do we talk about you know, getting the masses of our people out of poverty? When today, when about, I think it was a month ago, in Limpopo, you had malaria. Malaria, it's, 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 it's a very basics. It talks about the you know, failure of, 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 of the health system. It's a very basic thing. So, um, phone again. <laughs> um, so, so that is inherently why I'm involved, because transformation is a necessity, and in order to get, get that, there must be a capable state, and there must be money that is actually available in the state. I, I can't say, we're still writing what South Africa is going to be and what the politics of South Africa is gonna be, so I can't really predict it. I can only speak of now. Um, but what I know, um, sorry. what I know is that if anything is going to come out of this, is the fact that when we look at, I, I think when the state had originally, the mechanisms of the state and the constitution had been created um, by the likes of Sir Ramaphosa, um, I think, you know, there was almost this idea, if you look at the cause, there was almost this idea that someone who would be in the presidency was always going to be a good guy. You know, there's almost this, and I can understand where it comes from. You're coming out of the apartheid era, you think all your comrades are great, etc., etc. Yeah, I don't know. Um, but I think it, it, when we look at the checks and balances that are actually within the executive, you're actually quite shocked at how there's a lack of. So I think what's going to really come out of it is that we're going to be more vigilant than ever. Uh, we're going to be less trusting than ever. But we're definitely going to make sure that those checks and balances uh, are, are there in the state. Um, and yes, that is it. Thank you. Okay, so now I have to tell you how the law is going to save the day, but I can't really do that. Um, um, I want to start by using a specific example um, to illustrate a point and, then, uh, and, and about the role of the law and why the law might not be able to do as much as some of us lawyers would, would like to think that it would do. 
Now, some of you might remember that in, in 2014, 27th of November of that year, the Constitutional Court handed down a judgment in the Helen Sussman Foundation case, which was the second case dealing with the Hawks. The Hawks is the body set up uh, to, to be this independent, supposedly independent body to investigate and bring to the prosecuting authority winnable cases to prosecute corruption. And on the 27th of November, in the second judgment, the Constitutional Court made a very important finding. It rejected some of the arguments um, uh, provided by the Helen Sussman Foundation, um, but it did accept the one argument that is very important, and that is that the head of the Hawks alone should be the person to be able to decide what cases of corruption should be investigated or not. When the parliament changed the law in 2012, uh, the parliament said that um, it would be the head of the Hawks who would be able to come to decide uh, what corruption should be investigated, but it is always going to be subject to any policy guidelines issued by the minister and approved by the parliament. And it, there was also a provision that said um, the head of the Hawks could investigate and the Hawks could investigate any uh, form of um, serious offences if directed to do so by the head of the police service. What the court said is this uh, provision made the Hawks not independent. If the minister could be in involved and the minister could in effect have a veto about what kind of corruption should be investigated, uh, that wouldn't make the Hawks an independent body that could fearlessly investigate corruption. So the court nullified that, those provisions. Then on the 23rd of December, the head of the Hawks was suspended by the Minister of the Police. Now, it so happened that the Minister of Police didn't have the power constitutionally, legally, to suspend the head of the Hawks because the Constitutional Court had also nullified that provision in the uh, South African Police Services Act that said that the Minister of Police could suspend the head of the Hawks even before an investigation happened. Um, but nevertheless, despite the fact that the court clearly said, you cannot do this, the minister did it. He later lost, of course, when he, when he, when he went to court. Um, the minister, uh, Mr. Um, Anwar Dramat, won his case. But in the end, he decided not to fight the matter any further. He, handed in the, he threw in the towel. He was given, I assume, uh, a certain amount uh, to walk away. Um, and that was basically the end of the walks. I tell the story to show that the, the, despite the fact that the South African legal architecture is um, extremely impressive in terms of all the bodies created to um, uh, to hold those who might be involved in corruption or, or other forms of maladministration and wrongdoing to hold them to account, both in the criminal sense and in the political sense. These inst institutions are only as good as those people who are actually uh, staffed to, uh, sta staffing those institutions. Politics is about who decides and about who decides who decides. So in the end, um, it is not that difficult to hollow out certain institutions if you can just manage to get the right people, and I put right people, of course, in inverted commas, to, um, to be appointed to a specific body. It's for that reason that I am not... Um, I, if I had any money to put on it, I would put a lot, well, actually, I would put a lot of money on it, that the Hawks is not going to investigate with any seriousness the Gupta leaks, and it, the Guptas or anybody implicated in the, those leaks are never going to be prosecuted uh, as long as the political uh, terrain remains the way it is at the moment, because the, the Hawks is not an independent body. And the same, of course, goes for the prosecuting authority, uh, Mr. Sean Abrams will be very upset if he hears me say that, but uh, that is true of the prosecuting authority. Um, but it is not so for the courts. Uh, 
And when Marx said that the independent electoral co commission hasn't yet been captured, um, and that is one of the bright sides, as a lawyer, of course, I was immediately thinking, well, by and large, the judiciary has also not been captured. Um, the judiciary is, has not been captured for an uh, interesting reason that the appointment of judges is once removed from the political process. So who decides who decides is not so clear because the, the Judicial Service Commission is made up of a, a group of 23 people. Uh, on paper, the majority of those people should be ANC aligned, but one doesn't always know. They vote with the secret ballot, so we don't always know who they vote for. The president has now tried to um, pack the, the JSC by removing four people who he can appoint in terms of the constitution with four other people. It does, so far, it hasn't really made any difference to the outcome. And so what has happened is that, by and large, most judges in South Africa remain independent and quite fearless, sometimes quite shockingly fearless. It reminds me of the old joke about the apartheid minister of justice who said the problem with these bloody judges are once you appoint them, they think they've been appointed on merit and they start thinking for themselves. <laughs> and so that is, that is what our judiciary has been doing. So, given that the judge, judiciary has not been captured, there is, of course, a great, um, there's a great temptation for all of us to think, well, maybe the judges will save the day. The judges will, make, uh, will nullify the appointment of the head of the Hawks, as he did. The, it will nullify the head of the, of the National uh, Prosecuting Authority, as he had done in the past. Um, it will intervene in uh, certain case, cases, as he did in the um, public protector case uh, with Nkandla and so on. And that will be a kind of accountability to try and uh, circumvent or try and reme uh, be a remedial response to the fact that certain other institutions are not captured. Um, and this is very much in line with uh, some academic writing who suggest that especially in a country where one party is specifically uh, um, electorally dominant, as the ANC has up to now been in South Africa, uh, and where um, the parties, political parties are extremely um, tight-knit and they are strict party discipline in such as countries, uh, said people like uh, Professor Chowdhury, um, it is for a court to try and protect a certain uh, democratic space. And it is for a court to try and make sure that the rules of the game remain intact. Um, and uh, uh, for that reason, courts need to be a little bit more adventurous, which um, is exactly what the Constitutional Court did, for example, in the two cases dealing with the Hawks. Uh, in one of the few times, uh, maybe I, I shouldn't say that because it makes me sound like I'm conceited, but one of the few times I've been wrong in predicting how the Constitutional Court would come out in a case was the first case dealing with um, the scrapping of the Scorpions and the establishment of the Hawks. Because I said the Constitutional Court is never going to say that Parliament has a positive obligation to create an uh, independent corruption fighting body because nowhere in the Constitution will you find such a provision. They had to make this up, basically, and they were not very good at it. I mean, if, you, if I really wanted to write an academic article, I could say they could have been much better at faking it and creating this right that isn't really in the Constitution. But probably they did it because they thought something needed to be done. But as my um, explanation now uh, must have um, uh, illustrated, that was largely to no avail because uh, we'll see what happens with the appointment of a new head of the Hawks, but uh, what, what, what happened was that the previous head of the Hawks was intimidated and then uh, bought off to go away. Somebody else was appointed who was uh, never going to be serious about uh, fighting corruption. Um, secondly, so that the courts do not always work. Secondly, there's also a big danger 
in the more the courts get involved in uh, situations in which they are asked really to fight political battles um, and, and to, to make decisions about what are essentially issues that with far-reaching political consequences, um, the more endangered the, the courts become. Um, and the more endangered they become of, of being attacked um, as handmaidens of white monopoly capital, of uh, whatever you can think the terminology is. is uh, I'm sure the bell potentials of the world is, as we speak, through coming up with terms for the, for the judiciary. Um, so, so there's a danger for the judiciary because the judiciary is not elected. Judges, the only thing that, that makes the judges and their decisions stick is the fact that they are supported by the majority of citizens and uh, that they have some legitimacy and that people more or less believe their decisions to be fair. Um, I don't think anybody can be objective, but at least sort of fair and impartial. Uh, the judiciary can be fair and impartial. But the more they are asked to, to fight political battles, of course, the more difficult that will become because be more, more, the more polarized they, they become. So far, the Constitutional Court of South Africa has played quite a clever game, I think, and the judges will once again not like me for saying this, but the court has been, um, and the work of um, South African scholar Tienes Rue makes the argument, has been very pragmatic in the way it deals with cases. On the one hand, trying to be as principled as possible, doing what um, the scholars say it should do to try and protect the space, but sometimes pragmatically withdrawing or retreating or not go, being as bold as they should be. As, as, and retreating especially when they, the court sensed, in, in, I would argue, that somehow they did not have enough support from important power groups in society, from the media, from uh, political elites, from people in academia, uh, from the population at large, and so on. And so they then make a decision that is less bold. And so they've been very good at this. But I'm not sure that um, in and of itself, uh, in the long term, is really sustainable. So in the end, really, the only thing, the, the, the utopia or the heaven is really, I don't know which, who said that, Marx, uh, lies in, in the uh, realm of the political. Um, so if we don't fix the politics, every, I don't think anything else is going to, uh, the, the systems cannot hold, I would say. The systems, including the judiciary, cannot hold in the long term um, if we don't fix what is wrong in the, in the politics. Um, if one party remains uh, electorally dominant, if opposition parties remain unpalatable for the vast majority of voters, as so far they remain for many different reasons, um, one of them, uh, uh, shall I say that? <laughs> yes, uh, the premier here. Yeah. Um, so there are many different reasons for it. So, uh, so uh, and I think the problem that many of us make, especially those of us sitting in a room like this, uh, what we make is we think that we can change the world and we can change fundamentally the dynamics in the society by going to court. Um, that is the easy thing. Going to court, winning a court case is easy. Actually, changing the political culture, uh, mobilizing people politically, um, uh, creating uh, uh, political parties that are actually viable and attractive for the majority of South Africans and who happen also to be more or less uh, uncaptured or not corrupt or whatever. Those are the actual hard work that needs to be done. And the lawyers like me, we can tinker on the margins. We can go to the court or argue that the court must make certain decisions. Um, but in the end, I'm not sure that will save the day. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, uh, Pierre and the other speakers. I think you'll agree that it's been a uh,
fascinating uh, set of inputs. Um, if I could just very briefly, some of the take-home points for me, because every time I listen to, to Mark in particular, I see something else in our report, so I went back to it and, and double-checked. But, but to some extent, the one thing that, that has come through is that uh, radical economic transformation uh, is almost by design become the ideological engine for state capture. And I think that's really, really important. To some extent, that, beca that has become the new terrain. Um, and that, for me, was very interesting. So just some, just a, few, a few things that have struck me about the inputs is, I think Mark's um, point about the, 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 the five or six levers, the instruments of state capture or the instruments of institutionalized corruption are really important to keep in mind as an organizing framework. And, and he had the state-owned enterprises, kitchen cabinets, the public service generally, um, and, and then very importantly is uh, and, and quite worrying, because it reminds us of the apartheid years, is the control of the security apparatus. Uh, and, and increasingly one is seeing elements of that being played out uh, in, in the society. Uh, the other was uh, regulatory capture, and almost the high point is the capture of the national treasury. And I think that, for me, just sort of squares the circle in terms of uh, the project, if you like, the state capture project. Um, uh, we, 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 to some extent, had a reminder from, uh, from, uh, from uh, um, Tabi and Kule about the costs associated with state capture. But Kule, in particular, suggested one thing that's very uh, indirectly, I think, suggested a difficulty we have. Because he reflected on the fact as well, let's assume, uh, I think that's what he was suggesting, let's assume this all gets sewn up, the Guptas uh, are in jail or back in Dubai, and we, we restart, we press the restart. Well, then what are we going to do? Aren't we then still on this unequal growth path, this path dependency, this way about growth and development that still, uh, still hasn't changed? And so that's almost the much harder question. The, do we still drive past Kailicha and say, thank goodness the Guptas are gone, but actually nothing else has changed? And, and, and I think that's a really, really important question. Um, Piers depressing because we all assumed the courts were going to resolve everything, but I think that's quite important. Uh, the one thing is that the courts are not captured as yet, um, but that is a reminder, and, if, and, and I think that's what we'll try and do in the, in, in the sort of, uh, perhaps in follow-on research, is examples of institutionalized corruption in the rest of the developing world in particular. I mean, I would add, A, the courts are not captured, and B, the media is not yet under threat. And for me, those are the two that would go together. And if you look at much of Latin America, experiences with corruption there uh, suggest that uh, either capture of the media or, in fact, uh, violence towards the media is a key part of, of, of your levers and your mechanisms of state capture. So just final comments is where, what are the kinds of things that are interesting? Me, personally, academics are very selfish, so what are the kind? I think the one is we don't understand the economics of corruption. I don't think uh, we, we have appropriate models. I think there are lots of little theoretical models, but how corruption actually operates in a generic sense, we don't understand. We don't understand, uh, the report starts to do this. We don't understand state-owned enterprises and their capture in its gory details. We've given a little snippet of, of Transnet, and I, I, if there's one thing you look at, go and look at that figure on Transnet. It is unbelievable the extent to which you've got different enterprises, different players, uh, and, and, and so on, that are actually uh, operating just at that one level. But we don't have the numbers. We don't have a, an overview of, of, uh, of state-owned enterprises uh, in terms of financial flows. The third, which hasn't been mentioned, and those a few of my friends in the private sector here, is insider trading. There's been, the, the Stuart Theobald did a really good piece on the shorting of the RAND when Nene was fired, but I think that is uh, intellectually virgin territory. We really don't have a sense of insider trading in terms of shorting of the RAND and, of course, the bond market. And some of you may know that one of the key proponents within the Gupta uh, Enterprise uh, was, of course, a former bond trader. So if one can uncover what's been happening in terms of insider trading, I think there's a lot that, that can go to the courts, actually, in terms of criminal activities. Uh, the fourth is something which we don't have a proper sense of because South Africa doesn't have this history of, of institutionalized corruption is how to launder money. 
because uh, the report alludes to it, but this, this is a business enterprise. The fact that Hong Kong is the global center for money laundering is something also that we need to try and understand and explain. And then finally, uh, more sort of a journalistic approach, I think, is what are the short-term responses? Because currently, Gupta bank accounts have been closed down. Uh, the FIC has done great work in sort of closing them off on certain fronts, but how are they operating now? And getting an understanding beyond the Gupta leaks, which is stuff that's already happened, is how they're operating now. Anyway, let me leave it at that, and I want to open the uh, floor to questions. Uh, if you'd like to, introduce yourself, um, and perhaps what we could do is take um, batches of three or four questions. You can direct it to anybody in particular, or you could uh, open it to the whole floor. Okay, open to you. So we'll take uh, one, two, three, four, and five for now. <laughs> if you want to, you can introduce yourself. So we just... Yeah, okay, sure. Willing to collaborate. 
respond to the issue that I'm most preoccupied with at the moment, which is the um, question of strategic resistance and uh, the popular front. Um, so the, 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 the popular front is, 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 is a bit of a, a kind of football that is kind of bouncing around between a, a number of different players. So the SACP had an Imbizo uh, where they invited uh, all stakeholders to come and discuss the formation of a popular front to defend the constitution and, uh, and, 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 and democracy. And they invited business leadership South Africa. So I was talking to Adi Entoven from Business Leadership South Africa and he was rather amused about leading a delegation of business leaders and CEOs to an SACP gathering to defend the constitution against the, the alliance partner of the SACP. Um, uh, so, so, but the SACP doesn't want to be seen to taking leadership uh, of, of, of the Popular Front. The South African Council of Churches uh, has been working on various moves to facilitate the bringing together of the stakeholders to form a Popular Front but they themselves don't want to take the initiative. They don't want to be seen as convening and facilitating. So they're going to have a national convention in, in November uh, where they want to be seen to be creating holding space for others to uh, form a popular front. Um, then you have um, the, uh, the kind of uh, and the BC Jonases and, and that whole group, Fakey and so on, who have in principle refused to be bought, are either in or outside of parliament uh, and uh, are, are involved in various discussions, including with organized labor, on how to form a popular front. Um, and so we, we're in a quite an interesting situation where it's not that obvious exactly who uh, convenes uh, something more than just a, a two-day national convention where all the right-sounding things are said by the right kinds of stakeholders uh, and nothing happens thereafter. And I'm just looking at Vili over there and thinking back to the, to the, to, to the to UDF. And, you know, there is a generation of people from the 80s who are thinking about this question through the lenses of the 80s. And uh, Kuli and I have this discussion where he says, you know, you guys from the 80s are going to make a mistake thinking about the current conjuncture through the lenses of the 80s because you're actually hamstrung. So, you know, in other words, those people who weren't in the 80s may have a better, a better reading of the conjuncture to figure out what kind of... But I still think we can learn from the UDF, which was not... It wasn't just a one-off event. It was a movement, and it cascaded down and created a space for a multiplicity of coalitions at different levels of society around an issue. So the other... The other then discussion is then, well, what, how dependent is the emergence of the Popular Front on what happens in December? So if the, elect, if the ANC goes off the rails, goes south, and just uh, uh, either the election is rigged or it's not rigged and, the, and the, the, the Zuma power elites kind of wins, whoever that may be, um, then that is clearly uh, going to result in the strengthening of a popular front outside of the ANC. And, and, and for some people, it becomes the alternative, a really meaningful alternative that absorbs a bunch of uh, uh, key, key stakeholders. The other way of thinking about it is, well, if it doesn't go south, if a, a, a non-Zumba grouping kind of wins the election, in December, what happens to the Popular Front? And the answer some people give is, well, then the ANC leads it. Because uh, even, like was already been suggested, even if there's a shift in political leadership, the, 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 the networks, the shadow state networks, remain entrenched. And you still have to take them on. Who's going to take them on? 
so there's quite an interesting state of flux. Uh, and what I've experienced in giving these, these talks is the most common question that people ask is, what can I do? And the interesting thing about the UDF in the 1980s, it answered that question. So I think the key lesson we've we, we got to learn from that, that period, and this is where kind of I like talking and debating and disagreeing with Quille, is what can, uh, you know, how do we think about an answer to that question? What can, what can everybody do? Uh, I really think the, if the popular front doesn't deal with that question and it's just another elite deal, uh, maybe you know the right elite making a deal, I don't think that's going to be good enough. Yeah, just yeah. I, I mean, on, on the on the on the labour question, um, I, I don't think uh, a, a labour was strong enough to um, during the Mbeki era to mount a coherent strategic alternative to what was going to corporate restructuring. Uh, and all they could do, and Paul Aquino would say, we're going we're gonna to line up behind the, the Zuma ticket because uh, uh, he might be pliable enough in order to do what we want done, which is more state intervention. Uh, well, that backfired absolutely terribly. Uh, and after what I thought was significant is after the NEC meeting where the vote of no confidence didn't work, um, the Central Executive Committee of the of Kasatu met and Bladen Zamandi gave a really key speech like two days after Zuma said stop criticizing me uh, Blade went and criticized them uh, at the CEC of Kasatu but, the, but talking to people who were there the resolutions that were taken in response to kind of rising militancy uh, uh, within, within the membership including a walk against a march against state capture and so on um, there's a significant shift taking place in labor, I, I think, and that's going to be precisely how they're going to play their role uh, inside of the popular front is, is, is difficult because uh, uh, convening, the, uh, convening labor uh, is going to be difficult because of its fragmentation. Uh, so you, you have a situation where you have the churches, you have business leadership South Africa, you have the parties, you have fairly coherent civil society uh, networks and formations, Kuminaidu and those kinds of, but labor is very fragmented. Yeah, so I'd like to address the um, insider trading and uh, you know, the difficulty with following or tracking flows. I think you know, with, if, we are, if we believe that the um, security cluster is captured. It's very difficult then to have, to follow illicit flows and have information on insider trading because who else will, will do it but um, the security cluster, um, especially national intelligence. Uh, I think that also the Reserve Bank plays a very significant role here because this is, as the regulator of banks, um, they should know the amounts of money that are leaving the country all the you know, strange money that is going between banks. And I don't think that information is publicly known, and I don't think they will reveal that information publicly. I think that um, also with banks, banks cannot um, publicly reveal client information, and, and that's why it becomes very difficult then to follow the money, understand the extent of state capture, understand the amount of money that is leaving the country. I think, you know, so far forensic analysts have been helpful, and especially forensic journalism has been very helpful, uh, Amabungani and um, Scorpio. Uh, and also they've been able to do it with the help of insiders. So um, I think that for, for us outside, or even as an economist, it's very difficult to try to understand how, what is going on in, in some of these state-owned entities that we analyze. Because looking at the balance sheet, it doesn't really reveal chunks of money that have disappeared. It is only when I you know, started reading the Gupta leaks and I just realized how much money is actually leaking and some of these contracts are don't, unsavory or don't look um, or, or look very dodgy. 
and then you go back to the balance sheet, but this is not in, you know, revealed. You don't, um, you don't have evidence of it in these companies' balance sheet. And they've been very smart in hiding data. We've read about shredding of information, shredding of board minutes. Um, you wouldn't, you know, very recently, I think today I read uh, about the finance minister uh, being, uh, a, a letter being, a letter that was forged. And uh, apparently Ntlantlanene signed a big contract that related to Transnet and Ntlantlanene didn't sign the contract. So it's very difficult when you're operating in this very, um, I guess very seedy and dark environment as an analyst who doesn't ordinarily analyze dodgy deals. Um, I think that is, that is the difficulty here <laughs> for some of us. Um, but I also think, you know, looking at, I think a comment about um, business and, and, and corrupt officials, I think you're very right that there's a very, there's a symbiotic relationship between corrupt officials and business. And I know that um, some within the ANC have argued that if you want to do an inquiry, you need to take it all the way to 1652. Some of them are saying 1948. Um, and that's because they want to capture this, you know, the white monopoly capital element of corruption. And I think that you'd be very surprised if we had to just take a snapshot of the Zuma years, how much of the non-Gupta corruption um, could be uh, revealed. And I just think that if we do um, have this commission of inquiry, a lot more, we'll be shocked at the, the information that will be revealed. Um, in terms of an emerging politics, I think, as I, as I, as I had mentioned, um, I've always said that the big problem in South Africa is kind of our lack of imagination. And what I mean by, by that is societies find themselves in situations where the situation at, at, at play um, is new and has never been dealt with before, but the tools at which we're analyzing it and we're solving it are kind of outdated. And I think that's currently where we are. Um, and so if you look, if you actually look back, and I think there are some things to, to, to learn from the past, but if you look at, for example, the, the, the Freedom Charter, the, the writing up of the Freedom Charter, one thing that remains, and I think we still must have going forward, going back to Mark's popular front, is the fact that consensus and, 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 and actually this uh, ability to build relationships between different stakeholders is absolutely important. We can't go forward without that. Um, and so I, I, I think, you know, if you look at the post-2008 the post world, you need to almost have another uh, clip town, another Congress of the people where we come and we discuss this and we say which is, the, which is the way forward. But also, as much as there must be consensus, I also think that the future must be less compromising especially when we're talking on behalf of the most marginalized in society. Um, I think today a lot of people are, are, are angry because they felt like they've been too many compromises. The structure still remains the same. And so we can't, we, we, we can't have that happen again. Um, yeah. And then finally, um, I think the times will have an effect. But that, this, no, I don't, some people have an idea that our political system will change in terms of we'll have different political parties and that, and, and maybe that's the case. But my view is that I, I think the political parties will remain tomorrow, but it's just the ideas in which the political parties will change. And we already see it. We're moving, as, as, as you've got more young people moving left, you've also got the political parties trying to catch up and also move left themselves. And this happens everywhere. I mean, if you look in America, what the Republican Party was 200 years ago and what it is now, I mean, that's a different thing and what the Democratic Party is. Political parties change. And so this is part of the, the maturity that our democracy must go through. Okay, so I'll try and answer the question about the electoral system. <clears throat> I think the problem is in modern constitutional democracies, political parties is a problem. Because whether, no matter what electoral system you have, think about the United States um, and the Republicans in Congress and how often they have, uh, have uh, not supported or individuals in Congress have not supported Donald Trump, despite the fact that he has lied every single day since he's been appointed. So. 
So that's the first point. There's, there's a general problem with political parties. Political parties hold, uh, ha, is supposed to have a coherent program. It holds uh, a, a group together that can form a government with more or less a coherent program, but they are very overbearing institutions. So that's the, the first thing. Secondly, um, the, um, the problem, second problem that that is that is that arises is that whenever one party is extremely dominant politically and they start losing um, support, one of the first things that literature tells us they do is they try and manipulate the electoral system so that they can t stay in power. One of the ways, best ways for the ANC, for example, to stay in power would be to change the electoral system to a first-past-the-post system because uh, with 40% of the vote, you can get 70% of the seat seats in the National Assembly. Um, so I'm a little bit nervous about that. The, the counter-argument is, of course, that if you have an electoral system where people are more closely aligned and uh, um, accountable to the electorate through constituencies, they will actually be accountable downward and not to the party bus bosses upward. That works except if you have a system in which electoral um, in which um, constituencies are not really competitive and where the party bosses still decide who the candidate is in that constituency. So, for example, let's take Constantia. Now, the DA decides who stands in Constantia, say Helen Ziller decides who stands in Constantia. They can put up a traffic light in Constantia, the DA will get 90% of the vote there. Where is the accountability? It goes up it doesn't go down. So whether it all, it's, it can be a, a, enhance accountability, but there are also trade-offs. So simplistically saying, if we change the electoral system, there suddenly will be accountability, and Parliament will suddenly, all the members of Parliament will vote their conscience. They will have, vote for a vote of no confidence in President Zuma. I think that's a little bit too simplistic. Um. Got one eye on the clock, but perhaps we could take a second round, uh, maybe on this side. So we'll start one, two, three, four, five. That's it. security of tenure of office, unlike what happened with Kongbuk and Mott. Now, if, if you were the Chief Justice and I came back to you and said, look, this hasn't worked, what, what would you do to improve upon that set of criteria? For the rest of the panel, I would like to know uh, how do you see the future of the National Democratic Revolution and how, with your own expertise, you would address the culture of impunity that is in, abroad in the land of the um, Thanks very much. Thanks, Andrew Sill. I just still wanted to put out some queries and some issues that we had. Regarding the Chief Procurement Officer, I think what we have to keep in mind that the Office of the CPO has no legislative basis for authority whatsoever. And it was purely an appointment made in the Public Service Act, and was brought in a couple of years ago with the express intention of decentralizing the procurement process. But things came unstuck very quickly over that. As we know, the first CPO resigned last year in December. Interestingly enough, following a revolution, a revelation, whether it's true or not, I don't know what about that Pottinger, that some unexplained amounts had appeared in his bank account. Um, the guy apparently just didn't take it. And yet, by the absence of this of an effective CPO, this whole idea of trying to deal with new government of law, which has emerged at other levels of government, falls by the wayside, which brings me to the question of the instabilities of the management. Um, 
I guess most people wouldn't have thought a year ago that today you have four metropolitan municipalities under non-government uh, ANC control. But, and the important reason to note here was that between these four metros, they probably control something like the budget totaling about 130 billion rands, which represents a massive chapter chunk of total public expenditure. You can imagine the patronage um, that goes with it. Now, again, one starts thinking about conspiracy theories and what goes on in this kind of thing. Um, why the CEO office seems to be undermined. Why functions, for example, like housing, which would appear not to be given to uh, local government, at least the metropolitan uh, municipalities, was suddenly taken away. Um, one might think that perhaps certain political figures are starting to realize that influence was being lost in the metros, and as a result, um, one of the best ways of trying to control that loss of influence was to try and reduce their ability to dispense patronage with the procurement system, whether it's in terms of housing, in terms of their general budget spend. But just on that question, I think you mentioned about the latest Auditor General's report. Um, the figures, if I remember correctly, are correct, but the actual report wasn't the one that you mentioned. The most recent Auditor General report was the 15-16 local government consolidated report. What makes this scary is that that report relates only to local government. National and provincial government report is still coming out in October. Just wait and see what happens. If I may just make one or two more quick comments. <laughs> it's two business has let us down, the professions have let us down, particularly I'd say the legal and the, I should say the general commercial. Few organizations and institutions have been
we train. I mean, our graduates are probably like running the same operation on the side.
to the detriment of an unequal society full of the daily madness of criminal, full of the daily madness of inequality, a lack of opportunity, and, or, and most importantly, a lack of hope. This position makes what should be a legitimate anti-corruption stance So we, I, I know people are shuffling. We're going to take, I promise the speakers one minute each. I, I can't resist saying it was Amartya Sen who once said in a speech that uh, growth is hard enough as it is. You want to get inclusive growth, you want to get transformative growth, economic growth is hard enough. So uh, just keep that in mind when we talk about radical economic transformation, but uh, quickly from the... Uh, Martin, I share your angst about um, trying to conceptualize the political project. But as a political scientist, I'll go to the fundamentals, which is a political project is about how you use power. It's the, about the deployment of state power. Um, what we ha when you look at Russia, and you look at Putin, you don't come to the conclusion it's just a criminal gang. From the outside, it's clear what the political project is. When we, the very same people then look at ourselves and say, this is just a criminal project. It doesn't quite work for me. It's facilitated by the abuse of state power. That's what defines it as a political project. Um, yes, it's, yes, it's true that, there's, that there are a whole bunch of people who are participating in these processes. And I've spoken to quite a number of them. I buy them laptops, clean laptops. I give them laptops so they, 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 they're risk-free in terms of just writing out what they think. Uh, quite a number of them agree to do that. Really good people who have not participated directly in corruption but know what and see what is going on. They have the, the documentation. They pull out. They are shit scared. There are witch hunts taking place in these state-owned enterprises, which they are absolutely terrified about. Um, so, uh, you know, there are some people who don't realize what they're part of, and only recently have started to say, wow, I didn't realize that my role. So there's one woman who contacted me, and she said, I was, read I was, I was reading the Betrayal of the Promise report, I really loved it, and then I saw my name, and I was horrified. I had no idea I was, I, was, I was part of something. Please take it out of the report. I said, well, I'll meet you and discuss it and see what you're part of. And let's see whether we should take your name out of the report. You know, she, she had no idea. Uh, so, I mean, I think this is a political project in the sense that it, it has got an ideology. It is about the abuse of, the use of power. Uh, it, it masks what is actually going on as a, as a result of the, the abuse of power, and it is about a political project that is separate from what is actually at the core of the NC. It is a separate, is a, it is a silent coup. It's a political project. It's not just about criminal capture. Uh, and I, th I mean, the, just, just one comment on the developmental state. The developmental state ideology of the early 2000s, which came in as when the consumer, uh, you know, debt finance consumerism started uh, losing, its, its tra losing traction as a growth stimulator. Developmental state ideology comes in to base as a framework for saying public sector investment in infrastructure will crowd in private sector, in, private sector investments. That framework, you could argue, set up the conditions for what came later. But there's nothing inherent in the notion of the developmental state that makes it, by definition, prone to facilitating capture. I think one can still maybe rescue the term uh, if we start thinking about investment in long-termist, productive capacity, dividend-oriented, uh, job-creating, livelihood-creating, you know, the way Haroon writes about it, I think there may be uh, a way of, of rescuing the concept. Thank you. 
Um, on the question of um, why are there not enough leaks, I, I agree with Mark that it, it is terribly dangerous, and obviously many people fear that they'll lose their jobs. Um, but there are people who actually work for the Guptas or are employed by the Guptas, and these people don't know they are. And um, you know, I, my personal experience was that when I worked at Standard Bank, I was invited to speak on the economy. I had just come back from, I lived in London for 10 years, so I just come back into the country. I didn't know what TNA is, so I was asked to speak on the economy at a TNA breakfast. And so I did. And I didn't know who the Guptas were at that time. And then afterwards, I, and I was very, my usual self, very critical of the corruption or the lack of growth or whatever it is that I was, I was quite fiery and spicy. And um, then Atul Gupta walked up to me and said, um, that was very nice, would you like to write for New Age? And I'd never heard of this paper called New Age. So the only reason I said no was because I actually didn't know what New Age was. And that could have easily been me writing for a paper, for the Gupta paper, and being told what to write. Um, so I think that they're, you know, they're very smart at it. A lot of people, or some people, could be working for them in various ways without really knowing whether they are working for them or not. I mean, the case with um, regiments as well, where there's a sort of financial um, entity where one of the guys was working for the Guptas and the chairman claims to not have known the shenanigans, you know, the money going through the company. And this is a company where, um, which was also, which involved Tokyo Sohwala as well, who also didn't know what was going on. This is Trillian, as, who was at, um, Tokyo Sohwala is the chairperson of Trillian. And he went to the courts to say, I actually didn't know what was happening. I didn't know that Trillian was involved with siphoning, in siphoning money for the Guptas. Um, so it is very difficult. On, on the question of um, uh, the Ruperts versus the Guptas, I actually think you're very right. I think that the unfortunate thing about the state capture is that it comes at a time in South Africa where we need to redress um, the economy. You know, we can't have an economy where 30% of South Africans rely on social grants. And I always say this to corporate South Africa, that if you want to grow, you have to ensure that you, they, you, you contribute towards redress and you contribute towards transformation. And this may mean that you forfeit a few years of profit. But trust me, if only 5% of people are reliant on social grants, then can you imagine the capacity of those who are willing to spend or are able to spend and can you imagine the revenues of your company in 10, 15 years' time? But we can't also work on that project if we have this other corrosive project called state capture. And, and it just, I, you know, I was uh, speaking to a political analyst the other day, and I said, you feel like you, you, you're saying to, you know, corporate South Africa and um, the minority who are wealthy, to say, look, look, we're not done with you yet. We're just still focusing on state capture. And it's just, juggling the two is very difficult right now, but it, it is very necessary to, to address the, the injustices and also the inequality that we currently have in South Africa, whilst also dealing with the corrosive nature of state capture. Um, yeah, in terms of the Rupert and uh, the Guptas, I think you're very right there. That's why I was smiling. Um, um, and I wrote an article, I think a few months ago, that was titled The Hypocrisy of the Middle Classes, and it was actually a critique of the Zuma Must Fall marches, right? And my thing was, if you went to that march, first of all, I think anyone noticed that the vast majority of South Africans were not represented there. But two, a big critique that was coming out was, these are the same people that were saying the most negative things about fees must fall, about various movements that have come out of this country and come out from young people. Another thing was the fact that when you were within that movement, you could see signs that were not so much a critique of Zuma, but really a critique of blackness and a caricature of what, what is thought black people are in the state. 
right? So there was an attachment to corruption with being, very, being black. And you can't expect people to go and support that kind of thing. We were being told that all oh, South Africans must come out, they must come, but how can I go and, and support such a thing? And so I think that on the thing of involvement um, of a front, and I think we may disagree here, but my opinion of, of any kind of popular front is that in order for it to be as, as, as um, effective as possible, right, I do think that it has, to, it has to be on the left because the majority of people in South Africa have a very leftist economic view of, of, of how the economy should go, right? But two is also, you don't want a situation where you invite the EFF and then you also invite the Freedom Front Plus to the same room because in area, you're not even going to be debating the economics. You're going to be debating why one person is in the room with the other person. All right. So I, I, I absolutely understand what we're saying. That that has to be that has to be addressed. And um, in terms of uh, the developmental states, I must say I, I believe in the developmental states. And like anything that humans humans have have come up with, I do think it does have flaws. But the developing states, especially outside of, of the West, has proven to myself personally that it is the most effective means of moving uh, a, a vast majority of poor people to the middle classes and et cetera, et cetera. And this, I think, has been shown in the Asian Tigers. But as you said, there are certain, there are certain um, um, conditions that are necessary for that to happen. I absolutely agree with that. Um, funny enough, if you look at the policy documents that are making their way around the ANC and that will be discussed at the policy conference, that thing is about the development of state, nothing else. That document is a beautifully written document. But Obviously, the, the group um, that wants to push this document in the name of radical in transformation, I don't even think they've read that document. Because if they had read that document, they will realize that their project, their project of state capture is in, is in contradiction with the very document that has been typed out. Because the, 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 the document calls for more accountability, it calls for more capacity within the state, all of these things are being taken away. Um, and then finally, on the... I think he's left, but on the ideology of Mulife, uh, on, on Mulife and what drives Mulife, I, I don't think it's just money at all. I don't think it's money himself. Uh, um, I think it's, there's an ideology here that Mark was speaking about, and I've actually thought about this for some time. And the way I see it, it goes back to the whole, you know, that farms have been passed down to generations and generations. Mulife is a, 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 um, uh, has been a CEO of a state-owned enterprise. And the way the economy is geared, he will always forever stay, stay as the head of a state-owned enterprise. That will be the, the, the highest he can ever reach. So you can imagine when you're Mulife and you look at a guy like, who, who's the guy that runs shop, right? Um, sorry, I forgot his name. Christophe. Yes, Chris, and you see Christophe is getting almost a billion rand, he's getting almost a billion rand payout. You look at your eight million and you look at his eight billion and you say, there's no way. Right? In your head you say there is no way that you can be complaining about the eight million I'm making from a state owned enterprise and the one billion that he's taking away. Right? So for him it's an ideological fight. He's you that, that he's been used by the Guptas to actually make sure that he can actually you know, there are more opportunities available to him. Because if you're a Mulife and you're looking at how much the CEOs in South Africa are earning, you must tell yourself that it's a white man's game and there's no way you'll be able to play, even though you are competent, even though you're competent well okay. Even though you are competent. <laughs> <laughs> you know, even though yourself you are competent. So I think for Mulife it's more of an ideological game of we're going to use these Guptas to break this thing down. <clears throat> yeah, I agree with that last uh, comment. Um, very briefly, um, if I was the Chief Justice, uh, I, would, uh, I would have had to reverse my uh, Helen Sussman judgment and say that the appointment of the head of the Hawks needs to be changed so that maybe a two-thirds majority of the members of Parliament needs to appoint the head of the Hawks and have to reverse what I call the first Leninist judgment, the real, the substantive Leninist judgment will have to reverse that part that said the corruption fighting unit need not be separate from the police. I think it needs to be separate. That's the only way. Okay, I mean, I, I think we could probably carry on if people weren't starving and uh, wanting to go home. Um, but I think it's fair to say that the conversation continues. You can download the report, read it, and, and write more if you want to. But please just join me in thanking our panelists. I think it's been a great evening.